Greeting creatures in Neuland. In 2015, governments from around the world met in Paris and agreed to attempt to limit anthropogenic climate change to well below two degrees. Unfortunately, it seems that since then we have not done enough and the climate crisis has only gotten more urgent. Our next speaker, Stefan Ramstorff, has more accolades than I have time to tell. He's published more than 100 papers, including in the journals Nature and Science, co-authored four books, and won the Climate Communication Prize from the American Geophysical Union, the first European to do so. Please welcome him and heed his advice. Here's Stefan. Hi, everyone. My name is Stefan Ramsdorf, and I'm thrilled to be invited to give a talk at the Chaos Computer Club's Remote Chaos Experience 2020. I want to give you an overview of a climate tipping point, a very exciting subject uh, that I will try to shed some light on. But let's first start with some background on climate change. You probably know this image. It shows the global temperature evolution since the year 1880. Every line is one year. This is the more conventional way of viewing this time series. And the last seven years have been the hottest seven years since record keeping began in the 19th century. We know the reason for this warming, it's the increase of carbon dioxide, which you can see here for the last 10,000 years. And if you just look at the end of the curve, how the increase has accelerated in ever shorter time spans, we have seen an ever greater increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in our planet's atmosphere. This increase causes what we call a radiator forcing that is a kind of heating in terms of energy released per square meter of Earth's surface. And the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere until now is causing a heating at a rate of 2 watts per square meter Earth's surface. We understand the energy budget of our planet pretty well. On the left here in this diagram, you can see the incoming solar radiation in yellow. Part of that is reflected already in the atmosphere by the clouds, for example. Another part is reflected by the bright surfaces. That's the snow and ice surfaces primarily. And the rest is absorbed. On the right hand side, and let's zoom into that, you see in orange the long wave radiation, which is clearly distinct from the incoming short wave solar radiation by its wavelength. And this thick arrow of long wave radiation leaving the Earth's surface basically to a large extent gets absorbed by the atmosphere and the atmosphere itself emits like anything, any substance, any matter at a depending on its surface temperature on its sorry depending on its temperature emits also infrared radiation and one thing that few people realize is that the back radiation coming down from the atmosphere through the greenhouse effect the greenhouse gases is actually twice as large at the earth's surface as the absorbed solar radiation so heating by the greenhouse effect by the long wave radiation is twice as big as the absorbed solar radiation at the Earth's surface. And so it's little wonder that if we are increasing this natural greenhouse effect, which actually makes our planet livable in the first place, if we are increasing this effect, that it is going to get warmer. We can also quantify this effect and uh, 
if you add in not just the CO2 increase, but other human caused greenhouse gases and also cooling effects caused by humans, then you see that the total human caused warming that we see here in the orange bar is to within uncertainty as big as the observed global warming since uh, the 1950s. And that means that about 100% of the observed global warming over the past 70 years is human caused and the best estimates of the human caused warming is actually even slightly more than the observed warming which has to do partly or is consistent with the fact that solar activity has gone down so the decrease in solar activity has compensated a small part of the human caused global warming. It's also very interesting and especially to me as a paleoclimatologist who studies natural climate variations in Earth history and has done so for more than 25 years, how the modern warming compares with the changes in uh, the throughout the Holocene and before that since the last ice age and uh, this is what we see here based on decades of paleoclimate research countless sediment cores taken at the sea bottom ice cores on the big ice sheets and so on we have enough data now to form meaningful global average temperatures and you can see here the warming from the height of the last ice age into the Holocene um, the Holocene optimum, the warmest period about uh, until about 5,000 years before present and since then we have seen a very slow cooling trend which we have bent around due to human activities and uh, we have within a hundred years more than undone 5,000 years of natural cooling trend which normally would have very slowly continued. These natural variations, by the way, are due to the Earth orbital cycles, the so-called Milankovitch cycles. You can easily read up on those, for example, at Wikipedia. Now let's come to the famous, much feared tipping points in the climate system. What is a tipping point? That has been described in a seminal paper which I'm proud of uh, having been a part of from 2008 by Tim Lenton and colleagues and this is called tipping elements in the Earth's climate system and it says that the term tipping point commonly refers to a critical threshold at which a tiny perturbation can qualitatively alter the state or development of a system and the different parts of the earth system which can undergo such a transition they are called the tipping elements this whole concept is illustrated in the red line that's shown here in the horizontal axis we see a control parameter and that could be the greenhouse gas content of our atmosphere it could be the temperature it could be if you talk about natural climate changes, for example, those orbital changes, the what we call the Milankovitch forcing, which drives changes. And on the vertical axis, you see the res response. And if you imagine the control parameter changing from left to right in this diagram, you would uh, march along that upper uh, part of the red curve here, the branch, until you come close to a threshold and at that threshold the system will undergo a major change and reach then um, this lower part of the curve a different kind of equilibrium state. So it's basically a small change in the driver causing a very big systemic response. That is what defines a tipping point. If we want to be very accurate here, we can distinguish two different types of tipping points. The first one is what I just showed you is repeated here on the left side and it is characterized by the fact that uh, this red equilibrium line has one state for every point on the x-axis. So every 
amount of forcing corresponds to one particular system state and this system state just makes a major transition in a small range of the driving parameter um, around this threshold. Now a second uh, even more um, a drastic or nonlinear type of tipping point is shown in the right hand side where the equilibrium states are somewhat more complex than this single red line on the left. You can see here that there is again an upper stable branch and there is also a lower stable branch but they overlap. So there is a region that is shaded here where two stable equilibria uh, exist and it depends on the initial conditions on which of these branches you are. Now there is a, a what is called a bifurcation, bifurcation structure underlying this with a bifurcation point. There is a, an unstable branch which separates the basins of attraction of the two stable branches. So if you're in the bistable regime and you start kind of away from an equilibrium but above the dashed line, you will fall up onto that upper stable branch. If you start out below the dashed line, you will fall down onto the lower branch. That actually is pretty standard nonlinear dynamics. It's a whole branch of physics which investigates exactly this time, type of behavior in many different physical systems. So the, the second type of tip, tipping point, the right hand side one is corresponding to multiple equilibrium states, in this case two stable equilibria. That's why this arrow range here is called bistability, two stable equilibria. It is coming with irreversibility. So basically if you march to the right here on that upper stable branch, at that bifurcation point you fall off down onto the lower stable branch but you can't just go back up from there you have to go all the way to the left to that second lower blue point there until you can go back onto that stable branch the second type is actually um, as an everyday system that behaves like that it can be easily compared to a kayak if you're sitting in a kayak and you lean a little bit to one side then you experience a counter force. So the kayak is trying to upright itself, it's resisting you tipping it. But if you move further and further and further, eventually you will reach a tipping point. This is the point where the kayak stops resisting your further leaning over and instead it starts tipping over further by itself. Uh, and then it flips right over until it's upside down and you're falling out. So um, I, have, I have done this quite a few times. I have a kayak that is quite narrow where it uh, easily happens if you don't take care that you flip over. Now this kayak also has a range of bi-stability so once it's flipped over it's also in a stable state and it takes considerable effort to turn it upright again into the other stable state when it's vertical, upright rather than upside down. Now the whole point is that systems like this exist also in the climate system. The kind of first type on the left hand side corresponds for example to sea ice and on the right hand side this type of tipping element compares to uh, refers to the Greenland ice sheets or continental ice sheets also Antarctica or the Atlantic Ocean circulation. In terms of the transient behavior, that means if you, if you kind of go through a global warming phase, you're moving from left to right in these diagrams, then the, in, in that sense they don't differ very much because in either case you follow a line like this green line. So on the left hand side the green line more or less follows more or less closely the red equilibrium line with a certain delay depending on how sluggish the system responds. So that's why the green arrows are not exactly on top of the red line here. And in, a, in the right hand side case you have a similar thing. You're kind of 
in theory, in equilibrium, you'd fall off the cliff at this bifurcation point. But in practice, the system has some inertia. It takes some time. So if you gradually move uh, on the right, towards the right there, you will also follow a green line, which is very similar to the one in the left. So in practical terms, if you're not trying to go back, but you're just going forward, progressive global warming, the difference isn't all that big. And the main difference comes from the intrinsic time scale of the system. Obviously, sea ice can respond much more quickly to being just a few meters thick compared to continental ice sheet like Greenland ice, which is about 3000 meters thick. And that just takes a very long time to melt. Now here's an overview of different tipping elements in the climate system. A few examples you can see starting on the left here, the boreal forests that are the kind of northern forests, which typically like ecosystems do have a tipping point, a point of uh, collapse. The whole idea of these um, tipping points and, and the system collapse is very strongly linked actually to ecosystem research and the boreal forests they have a point where they get too dry that fires and pests are uh, weakening the forest so much that in a hot summer like uh, last year in Siberia they go up in flames lit by lightning. Or the Amazon rainforest this is also a tipping element has been shown in many uh, vegetation dynamics models, which is partly linked to the fact that such a forest generates its own rain to an extent by storing water in the soil, keeping it there and then bringing it up again uh, through evapotranspiration, as we call it. The tree brings up water to the leaves from where it then uh, enters the atmosphere again and then it moves with the winds and maybe 50, 100 kilometers downwind, it falls again as rain. So it's a kind of perpetual rain recycling system, which keeps the whole forest nice and moist. But if you uh, stress that too far uh, and reduce the first of all you cut down forests you make it smaller and also you make it more drought prone by warming up the climate which leads to faster loss of moisture etc greater moisture requirements by the trees then you can stress it up to the point where it gets so dry that even the Amazon rainforest can go up in flames Another example, if you see the top right, is the permafrost thawing. This is when it gets too warm. There is a very simple uh, threshold, namely the freezing point. Of course, that is a tipping point in a sense, a freezing point of water. Uh, when the permafrost thaws, then there is methane gas escaping to the atmosphere, which then also can enhance the further warming, which then leads to more permafrost thawing and so on. Typically, these tipping points are associated with such amplifying feedbacks. I will discuss three of these in a little bit more detail. The Greenland ice sheet, which, which is undergoing accelerated ice loss. The Atlantic overturning circulation, or often called Gulf Stream system. And the third one is the coral reefs, um, which are suffering from large scale die off, which also as a typical ecosystem response have a critical threshold. These examples are discussed in our paper, Climate Tipping Points, Too Risky to Bet Against, which we published in Nature about one year ago. And they are also some of these tipping points interact, they're interlinked. And uh, one of our quotes there is that the clearest emergency would be if we were approaching a global cascade of tipping points. That is a situation where one tipping element is triggering the next one in a kind of domino effect. This is what we fear most.
Now let's have a look at the Greenland ice sheet. This is a NASA video showing based on gray satellite data where the ice sheet is losing mass. You can see in increasing blue colors here that uh, the Greenland ice sheet is indeed uh, losing mass. You can look up at the NASA vital signs website, which has very good indicators of various vital signs of our planet, including the data on Greenland ice uh, loss constantly updated. Now, the point with the Greenland ice sheet is that it does have a stability diagram like the schematic one that I showed you earlier with the bistable range. And this is shown, uh, I think it was shown for the first time by uh, my colleagues uh, Karloff and Ganopolsky in 2005 in this article where they used a three-dimensional ice sheet model coupled inside a global climate model with ocean atmosphere and so on. And on the x-axis, there's basically increasing amount of heating going on. In this case, because they were interested in the paleoclimate question, it is this uh, driving force by the orbital cycles, the Milankovitch cycles. Um, you don't need to understand the numbers. But on the vertical axis, you see the response of the ice sheet, the size of the ice sheet in million cubic kilometers. And you can see that upper branch in the blue line, we're actually moving towards the right here uh, in this uh, model simulation experiment. And you can see you stay on that upper branch until you reach this value on the x-axis of around about 500. And this is where the tipping point is. There, the ice mass declines, melts away, away very quickly. And you then end up at that lower branch with no ice on Greenland. And they played this game. They ran this simulation out to more than 550 watts per square meter. And the light blue line is what happens when they return. You know, when they turn down the heat again, you, you move towards the left on this diagram, but you don't go back up the same way as a dark blue line. You have to go to much lower radiation values until the ice sheet starts to grow again and comes back. The dots, by the way, are points where this has to has been run for many thousands of years really into an equilibrium just to show that there are really for the same value on the x-axis two very different equilibrium states with and without Greenland ice sheet. And the fact that uh, we now and in the Holocene in the last 10,000 years have a Greenland ice sheet and it actually is stable in the Holocene climate is only because of the initial condition because we came out of an ice age. If you took away the Greenland ice sheet now, then in the current climate or the Holocene or pre-industrial climate, it would never grow back. What is the positive feedback there? with positive, we don't mean that it's good. It's actually quite bad, a positive feedback. We mean an amplifying feedback. And the key amplifying feedback here is what is called the ice elevation feedback. The Greenland ice sheet does not melt because it's very cold at the surface, mostly below freezing. And why is it so cold? because it is very high up in the atmosphere. This ice sheet is 3,000 meters thick after all. So it's like in a high mountain area where it is quite cold. If you took away that ice sheet though, the surface then would be down at sea level uh, or even below if you did this quickly because the, the bedrock is depressed, but the surface would come up to sea level. But down there, it's much warmer than up at 3000 meters altitude in the atmosphere. And there it is actually too warm to keep any snow on the ground year round, which would be required to regrow a new Greenland ice sheet. And that's why you'd have to go back to a much colder climate than the Holocene to get the Greenland ice sheet back once it were lost. This is a typical example of this amplifying feedback, which leads to a self-stabilizing system. It can either self-stabilize in the upper branch here when you start there, or it self-stabilizes in the lower branch with no ice when you start there. This is what makes it a bistable system. To summarize, 
the Greenland ice sheet is melting as the NASA data, the GRACE satellites show, but also other data sets. It has a tipping point due to the ice elevation feedback. Now, what I haven't shown, but it's come out in, in study with many climate model simulation experiments going through um, more than 200,000 years of uh, simulations from the past through the Eemian interglacial period where we know how much the ice sheet shrank back and we could use those data from the past behavior of Greenland to calibrate the model. And uh, so we know the tipping point for the complete loss of the Greenland ice sheet is somewhere between one degree and three degree global warming. We're already at 1.2 degrees global warming, so we have started to enter the danger zone where we cross that tipping point. It doesn't mean that it suddenly starts to melt very fast or so because it has its own intrinsic slow response time. But what that crossing that tipping point means is that even without further warming, the Greenland ice sheet is doomed. It will continue to melt until it's gone. And this will lead to seven meters of global sea level rise, uh, drowning most of our big coastal cities and many island nations. Here is a look at the future from uh, model simulations from uh, Ashwanden from NASA. And you can see um, nice view of what the surface looks like and here's what the what it looks like in the ice sheet model you can see the ice flowing you can see it retreating so in purple that's bedrock that is exposed where the ice sheet has withdrawn in this simulation and so that's as much as ice of ice that you would lose in the coming 300 years a substantial fraction of the Greenland ice sheet Now let's look at another kind of tipping element and that is the Gulf Stream system or the North Atlantic current and I, I can't really introduce this topic is one of my favorite topics which I have studied since the early 90s uh, without showing a clip from the famous Hollywood blockbuster The Day After Tomorrow. What about the North Atlantic current? What about it? The current depends upon a delicate balance of salt and fresh water. We all know that. Yes, but no one has taken into account how much fresh water has been dumped into the ocean because of melting polar ice. I think we've hit a critical desalinization point. Yeah, now that um, statement about the critical desalination point is a Co completely correct description of the bifurcation point of the Atlantic circulation. I'll show it in a minute. And the, the statement that nobody has taken into account the meltwater from the Greenland ice sheet is also uh, was completely correct when the movie appeared in 2004. Until then, the typical climate simulations that you could see in the IPCC reports, uh, actually until quite a few years later still, had not taken account Greenland meltwater because basically at that point in time, the models, almost all climate models were just ocean atmosphere models plus land surface, but they didn't have continental ice sheet models coupled into them. And uh, so in the meantime, of course, uh, we have uh, better models that include experiments either with artificially added Greenland meltwater from data estimates or fully coupled with ice sheet models. And uh, from that, an example here being that Nature article by Klaus Böning and colleagues, we know that the meltwater input from Greenland has a non-negligible effect on the North Atlantic overturning. It's probably not the dominant effect, but it adds to various factors that weaken this North Atlantic current. And we also know that this system has a well-defined tipping point. Actually, I described it in a Nature article in 1996 due to a salt 
transport feedback. The basic idea behind that uh, has actually been known since the late 1950s or early 60s uh, since work by the famous American oceanographer Henry Stommel. But what I showed in my Nature article in 96 is that it actually works that way in a complex three-dimensional global ocean circulation model, not just in very simplified uh, models. And since then, this has been shown for a whole range of different uh, climate models. The salt transportation feedback is also one of these amplifying feedbacks, and it's easy to explain. The overturning circulation of the Atlantic is called overturning because it's, it's really a vertical overturning where water sinks down from the surface to great depth of two to three kilometers in the Atlantic because this water is heavy and it spreads then in the deeper ocean until it rises up in other parts mainly around Antarctica in, in, in the um, Circum Antarctic circumpolar current area and comes back at the surface. So basically the whole ocean is overturned with deep water being renewed and uh, then uh, coming back to the surface on very long time scale of uh, about a thousand to two thousand years for a complete overturning there. Now the whole system is driven by the fact that the water sinks down where it has the highest density and that's in the northern Atlantic and around Antarctica, around the Antarctic continent. And it has the highest density there, not only because it's very cold, but also quite salty. This is why you don't have deep water formation in the North Pacific. In, in the northern hemisphere, you only have that in the North Atlantic. And that's because the North Atlantic uh, waters are quite salty. And this is because this North Atlantic current exists and brings salty water from the subtropics up to the high latitudes, where normally it isn't very salty because it gets diluted by excess rainfall. Whereas the subtropics have excess evaporation and that's why they're salty. And so it's a, like a chicken and an egg situation the northern Atlantic is salty because you have this overturning circulation and you have this overturning circulation because it's salty there. And so you can see the self-amplifying feedback there again, which means it is a self-stabilizing system up to a certain breaking point, a tipping point, uh, which can be reached if you add too much fresh water diluting the northern Atlantic. And um, the stability diagram again looks like the, that second one. You've seen that for the Greenland ice sheet. Um, as I said, this has been verified in detailed model simulations with many different models that it really works like that in a complex 3D situation where you have, depending on how much fresh water you add into the Northern Atlantic, this is the control parameter here. Uh, you can move along that upper stable branch with the overturning circulation until that stomal bifurcation point and there this overturning breaks down and you fall down onto that lower branch without this overturning. It's labeled here NADW flow, that NADW stands for North Atlantic deep water. It's, uh, yeah, I would say, one of the favorite water masses of the oceanographers. Now let's look at the Gulf Stream, the surface circulation in a climate model. This is the CM 2.6 global coupled climate model ocean atmosphere by the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton. You can beautifully see the Gulf Stream in dark red here because it's warm, uh, leaving the coast of the United States at Cape Hatteras there, starting to meander, breaking up into these eddies, etc. And it actually means the meets the cold waters coming down inshore uh, from the north, which are shown in blue here. And so this is what this uh, the surface part of the circulation looks in a global climate model. And if you add carbon dioxide to that climate model's atmosphere, the climate warms, of course, 
but it does show a peculiar pattern of sea surface temperature change which you see here and this actually shows the sea surface temperature change relative to the global mean so everything that is blue has either warmed less than the global average or even cooled which is uh, actually the case south of Greenland and everything that is orangey or red has warmed substantially more than the global average sea surface and you see a very strong uh, pattern in the northern Atlantic with this big cold blob, the blue blob south of Greenland and a very warm region inshore of the Gulf Stream along the coast of North America. And in the climate model, of course, we are a bit like gods in that sense uh, that we have complete information about what's going on there. Uh, if we store all the data at every grid point, we know exactly everything that's happening and we can an analyze the reasons. And the reason for this funny pattern in the Northern Atlantic actually is a slowdown of the North Atlantic overturning circulation. That means that less heat is transported to the subpolar ocean south of Greenland there, that blue area, which makes it cool down. And the Gulf Stream proper at the surface moves inshore. There is complicated dynamical reasons for that, but there, there is already long before this was uh, shown in this model, a theoretical underpinning for this. It has to do with the vorticity dynamics on a rotating sphere, too technical to go into in such a talk, but it's a well understood phenomenon. And so we know that this slowdown of the Gulf Stream system is the reason behind this peculiar temperature pattern. And this pattern is predicted by this climate model for a global warming situation. And uh, my PhD student, Lev Gezesa, who was the first author on this nature paper from 2018, she looked at all the available measurements of sea surface temperatures since the beginning of the 20th century. And of course, because we have only limited ocean temperature measurements, we have only a fuzzy picture here, not a sharp one like in the climate model. But you can see a similar pattern in the North Atlantic in the observations compared to what the model predicts in response to a slowdown of the overturning circulation. And our conclusion here is that we are actually observing this slowdown of the circulation. Why do we take indirect evidence for this like this? Because we don't, of course, have measurements going back a hundred years or more about the strength of that overturning circulation. We have actually only started to measure this regularly in 2004 with a so-called rapid array at 26 degrees north in the Atlantic. And uh, what we reconstructed about the evolution of this current uh, for the last period where we do have the direct measurements agrees well with what um, the, the direct measurements show. We concluded that the overturning circulation has declined since at least the mid 20th century by about 15% so far. There are, of course, other indirect types of measurements. Uh, you can use sediment data of various kinds and with various methodologies to reconstruct the strength of this Atlantic overturning. And a number of different studies are compiled here in this diagram. And even though, of course, they, they differ somewhat in the detail, they all tend to agree in this overall picture that the Atlantic overturning circulation has been quite stable for the previous thousand years or so before the 20th century, but it then uh, in the 20th century has showed a, a clear declining signature. And one example of the media coverage of this is that Washington Post article here, which if you can see the small print of the most read articles there on that day, actually made it to number three of the most read Washington Post articles. There is definitely an interest in science and climate change uh, science uh, by the readers in the newspapers. So far we've talked about a slowdown and not so much about um, 
where this tipping point is. One reason is we don't know really. We know there is this tipping point that is a robust result of many different studies and model experiments and theory, but we don't know how far away we are from this. That is very typical for these tipping points because they involve highly nonlinear dynamics. That means they can depend very sensitively on the exact conditions. For example, in this case, the exact salinity distribution in the Atlantic and the exact circulation pattern and uh, models get these things kind of approximately right, but not exactly right. And if you have a, um, a situation where the question of where the tipping point is, is very sensitive to the exact conditions, then you have a large uncertainty about where the tipping point is. And um, so there is discussion in the literature. I just uh, point out to one study here in Science Advances that try to correct for the uh, inaccuracies in how we can reproduce the salinity in the Atlantic waters and found that if you correct for that, the circulation is actually a lot more sensitive than in other models. And maybe that model is more correct. Of course, it has other weaknesses as well. We don't know which of the models is correct, but should we cross this tipping point, then the North Atlantic circulation system would break down and you get a temperature pattern like the one shown here. The cold blob in the Atlantic that is now only over the ocean, it exists, right? It's the only part of the world that has cooled since the beginning of the 20th century, but it hasn't affected any land areas. But if the circulation would break down altogether and not only weaken by 15%, this cold would expand greatly and affect Great Britain, Scandinavia, Iceland, as you can see here, which would then get a much colder climate, whereas the rest of the globe continues to have a warmer climate. This is really distinct from an ice age. And uh, so this is also really distinct from that Hollywood movie, The Day After Tomorrow, where the earth goes into a huge uh, ice age, uh, instant freeze. That of course is totally unrealistic. And the, the screenwriter and the director, they knew this. They actually told me that if they were in the business of making a movie for a few million viewers, they would stick to the laws of physics. But since they make movies for a few hundred million viewers, they stick to the laws of Hollywood drama. But you would get a substantial regional cooling with major impact on ecosystems, on human society. Now let me come to the third type of tipping point that I want to discuss today. This is the coral reefs. Coral reefs, like many ecosystems, do have critical thresholds. Coral reefs are very important, even though they only cover a very small percentage of the Earth's surface. They support a quarter of all marine life. 40% coral cover of the world has already been lost. 100 countries depend quite substantially on corals. There's a 800 billion total global asset of coral reefs, so it, it does have a major impact on people. Now corals, when they are about to die, they bleach. They are abandoned by their algae that provides them with nutrition, and that's why they lose their color. And then after a while, they they die, they get covered by other, by seaweed, non-symbiotic algae, and they die. And they do have a temperature threshold. There's a critical warming threshold where this bleaching happens. But an additional factor, not yet the most important factor, is the acidification of water. It's a direct chemical chemical effect of adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which uh, then goes partly into the oceans and acidifies the ocean waters. But the main effect until now is the marine heat waves, which cross more and more frequently the temperature tolerance threshold of coral reefs. And here you can see that for the Great Barrier Reef, a huge fantastic world wonder that you can see from space. And you can see here the bleaching in the years 2016, 2017, and 2020, three major bleaching events which affected uh, 
in each case the red area here with the most severe bleaching you can see that by now largest a very large part of the Great Barrier Reef has bleached in these three events uh, it's very tragic and you can see here for example the March uh, the 2016 bleaching event in March the coral was bleached by May it was already overgrown by seaweed and just in 2015 and 2016 we actually had worldwide coral reef bleaching not only at the Great Barrier Reef in Australia only the blue ones out of these hundred reefs that were observed in this study only the blue ones escaped bleaching so we are actually in the midst of a great worldwide uh, coral die-off event which is another prediction of climate science coming true. If you look at the latest IPCC report it states that with two degrees warming virtually all coral reefs will be lost more than 99 percent. 1.5 degree warming if we manage to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees we can save between 10 percent and 30 percent of the corals. That is really depressing. Now let, let me talk briefly about what can we do. A major success is of course the Paris Accord, the biggest failure of which is that it hasn't come 20 years earlier. After all the world community already in 1992 decided to stop global warming at the Rio Earth Summit. Um, the nations signed the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on climate change and it took a full 25 years of further negotiations to finally reach the Paris Accord. Now you can see here that the goal of this is to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial level. So it's not 2 degrees, it's well below 2 degrees. That's a very important point. Many countries would not have signed up if it simply had said 2 degrees, which was an older goal, um, but it has shown to be insufficient. And um, and to sorry and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels so that is a more stringent Paris goal but at least the nations have committed to pursue efforts so my view is that every person should ask their own government what you are doing here is this a credible effort to try and limit warming to 1.5 degrees we might not make it but at least we should try to limit the warming to 1.5 to avoid the risk of destabilization of the Greenland ice sheet uh, almost complete coral die-off and many further risks so what does this entail that is an important point if you want to limit global warming to some value whatever it is 1.5 2 3 whatever you choose it means you can only emit a limited amount of carbon dioxide that is because the amount of global warming is to good extent proportional to the total amount of co2 that we have ever emitted so to the cumulative emissions it's like filling a bathtub with water if you want to draw the line at any level and say no further than here you can only add a limited amount of water and if you want to limit global warming to some value you can only add a limited amount of co2 to the atmosphere and this is shown here for two different uh, examples two different amounts this is actually the numbers here are emissions from the year 2016 so it's uh, don't take these numbers from now uh, we have already had four more years of uh, emissions the solid lines throw show three scenarios with 600 billion tons of co2 and they all have the same amount of emission so they all three solid lines get the same amount of warming 
This is about, actually these lines correspond to about a 50% chance of ending up at 1.5 degrees. And so they all uh, get you the same amount of warming, but with different times of when the peak emissions are reached. So 2016 went past uh, without us uh, getting over the peak of the emissions. 2020, maybe we still have a chance. Emissions have dropped a bit in 2020, but not for structural change mostly, but due to Corona. But we still, we have a chance that maybe next year they are lower still. And what this shows is that the longer you wait, the steeper your reductions have to be, not only because you're starting later, but also because you have to reach zero earlier at the end. Notice how all these three lines, the later you start with reducing, the earlier you have to reach zero emissions because the surface area under these curves is what counts for the climate goal. The dashed line is a more generous goal, which would uh, end us at about 1.75 degrees or so, best estimate. This is kind of the weaker Paris goal of well below 2 degrees, which would allow us to gradually reduce emissions to zero by 2050. This is not counting in any negative emissions afterwards, by the way. This is the net emissions, if you like. So we have to reach net zero emissions in 2050. But of course, if we wait five more years until emissions start to decline, then they'll have to be at zero five years earlier. So this is why it's so important to start now. This, by the way, is from an article by Cristiana Figueres et al. in Nature, uh, published 2017, um, where I was a co-author as well. Now, final point, um, can tipping points maybe help us? And I'm talking here about societal tipping points, and uh, there are also some interesting uh, studies on that. The basic idea is that, shown in the top right here, we are in a kind of stable equilibrium where the red ball is now, and uh, we are stuck there. It's, it's hard to get out of this. But there is a better equilibrium, a more stable one, further off to the right. And the question is, how do we get over the hill into that beneficial equilibrium of a sustainable global economy, a sustainable energy system, a stable climate, and so on, complete decarbonization? That means no more fossil fuel use. And these, this green addition there that is added there is there are just some examples of how we can make this transition earlier uh, easier and the hill that we have to get over smaller so we can make this current status quo that we're in a little bit less comfortable by putting a price on carbon we can um, make the transition easier by subsidizing re renewable energies there are uh, there is a greening of values. There is a tipping point in thinking in society. There are many co-benefits of this transformation in terms of avoided air pollution, for example. Uh, millions of people die every year from outdoor air pollution, which would uh, to a large extent go away if we stop fossil fuel use. And uh, we have seen a massive movement by the young people Fridays for Future. Here's Greta Thunberg uh, talking to me at our institute. Uh, she came last year to visit us there. Here is a Friday's uh, demonstration in Berlin where I took this photo. This is really changing the society's values and it, it's changing election results. And it could be a tipping point towards a sustainable global society. And with that hopeful message, I want to end and I thank you very much for your attention. If you want to read more, there's a couple of books of mine that have also come out in English. Uh, you can follow me on the blogs and of course in social media, preferably at Twitter. I put also the Scientist for Future logo there because uh, many thousands of scientists are engaged there to try and stop the climate crisis. This is really a matter of a survival of civilization. Thank you very much for listening. You should stick to science and leave policy to us. Well, we tried that approach. You didn't want to hear about the science when it could have made a difference.
Thank you so much, Stefan, for your talk. Now we have some questions from the internet. Let's see, the first question, which additional tipping points will be triggered at two degrees, three degrees, and so on? Um, that is actually a difficult question to answer because of the uncertainty that I mentioned in my talk about where these tipping points are. Um, there is one in Antarctica, the Wilkes Basin, that is a part of the Antarctic ice sheet that, that could be triggered, say, below three degrees. There are others like the ocean circulation where you probably, at least we hope, you have to go beyond three degrees to really trigger a collapse of the Gulf Stream system. But the, the truth is that there are very large uncertainty ranges. Uh, and the main fact is that with every bit of extra warming, we increase the risk of crossing more tipping points. And are there some of these tipping points that are interrelated or correlated? For instance, could we save some tipping points if we are able to save others? For instance, the collapse of the Gulf Stream. Um, yes, there, there are these interconnections. For example, if, if the Gulf Stream system collapses, it will affect the atmospheric circulation, the monsoon systems, and can shift the tropical rainfall belts. This is not just theoretical. We see that in paleoclimate, where we have seen these collapses of the North Atlantic circulation. And uh, the paleoclimatic proxy data show that it comes with shifts in the tropical rainfall belts that could then, in this way, trigger a major drought in the Amazon region if the Gulf Stream system collapses. And so uh, it would be very wise to prevent these tipping points, especially when it comes to the ocean circulation or atmospheric circulation, because that's really going to mess up the, the weather patterns in a major way. How long have we known about human-caused climate change? Well, in principle, in the 19th century, uh, Alexander von Humboldt actually wrote in 1843, if I remember correctly, that humans are changing the climate by cutting down forests and emitting large amounts of gases at the centers of industry. That's almost a literal, literal quote by Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, we've known about how sensitive the climate is to a change in CO2 since the Swedish Nobel laureate Svante Arrhenius, remotely related to Greta Thunberg, by the way, uh, in, in, yeah, studied the effect of a CO2 doubling. He wasn't worried by that because he thought global warming would be great, you know, bring it on. Let's just uh, die. No, no, it's back. Um, you can see my picture still? Yeah. Don't know what happened there. Um, so he, he suggested, uh, you know, burning a lot of coal to enhance global warming. I guess he came from Sweden and thought coal is bad uh, without thinking this <laughs> through properly. But the first real expert report warning the US government, Lyndon B. Johnson, of the coming global warming due to fossil fuel use was a rebel report in 1965, exactly 50 years, half a century before finally the Paris Agreement was reached. Will you be publishing your slides from the talk? Uh, yes, I will uploading the slides. What is or, or what should be the ultimate goal of the climate change mitigation? For instance, is it saving lives, saving other species? Well, I think the, the ultimate goal is, of course, preserving human civilization as we know it. Because I think if we let this run, we will not only destroy a lot of ecosystems and uh, biodiversity, but we will probably cause major hunger crisis, which, you know, with big droughts like the, the one in Syria before the unrest in Syria started, in 2011, the country went through the biggest drought in history. And according to sediment data from the Eastern Mediterranean, it was the worst drought in at least 900 years. And then, you know, I think, especially in some unstable conflicted countries, this can really 
turn them into failed states. That is what happened in Syria. And uh, it's what a German uh, report for the German government actually warned in 2009. Um, it was called Climate Change as a Security Risk. I was actually one of the co-authors of that report because I was in the German government's advisory panel on global change at the time. And I think we will see increasing hunger crisis, failed states, and all the effects that that has on international politics if we cannot keep global warming below two degrees. And finally, is there a specific call to action for the chaos community? Is there anything that we can do with our mindset and our skills? Um, that's a good question that I haven't thought about, but uh, maybe you can um, know yourself the best thing what you can do. I think the key is really to keep up the pressure on the political world, like Fridays for Future has been doing. Go on the streets, protest, vote with climate as a priority. I think these are the key things that everyone should be doing. And specifically in, in whatever profession they are, they will see some ways of how you can help to reduce emissions in your company, put sustainability at the top of the agenda and so on. Stefan, thanks so much for taking the time to join us to, today. It's a great pleasure and honor. Always welcome. And now the news.